Welcome to Laws 13013 Legal Professional Conduct, Topic 10, Conflicts of Interest. I'm Stephen Colbrand. The reading for this topic is Isaiah Ross, Ethics in Law, Lawyers, Responsibility and Accountability in Australia, Chapter 12. In this particular module, you should be able to appreciate the role of and limitations on informed consent as a solution to problems of um, loyalty. Critically evaluate the Australian approach to problems of concurrent representation. Discuss the position of the legal practitioner where someone other than the person confronted by the legal problem pays legal fees. Identify potential conflicts of interest and discuss the use of Chinese walls, or in other words, information barriers in situations of successive representation. Not all of these particular items are covered in this lecture, but they are covered across this lecture, your readings and the notes. Conflicts of interest are a major source of complaints against lawyers and often result in disciplinary action and even the issue of an injunction. It is essential for you as a practitioner to appreciate just how such conflicts can emerge and more importantly how to recognize and avoid them in the first place. A conflict of interest arises when the interests of clients, former clients, the law firm or its partners, the lawyer themselves, the lawyer's relatives actually or apparently conflict with one another. Conflicts arise in many situations, including where the financial interests of both the lawyer and the client conflict, the lawyer acts for both parties to a transaction, a lawyer is uh, called on as a witness, or the lawyer opposes a former client. When you study this topic, you will readily realize that confidentiality, client representation and conflicts of interest are all intertwined concepts. There's a fine balance of two competing public interests. That of client confidence in their lawyer and non-disclosure of confidences by that lawyer. And secondly, a client being represented by a lawyer of their choice who is, re who is free to receive their instructions. The main categories of um, conflict of interest that we'll be examining in this podcast are shown in this diagram. They include the conflict between the lawyer and client interests, financial or otherwise, the situation where a lawyer seeks to act for both parties, lawyer witnesses, opposing a former client, sexual relations with clients, and gifts from clients. We'll now have a look at each of these in turn. Firstly, the conflict between interests, financial or otherwise, of a lawyer and their client. The basic principle is explained by Justice Clark in Clark against Barker, 1989, New South Wales Conveyancing Reports, 55483. The judge said this, It is well settled that a solicitor has a fiduciary duty to his client or her client. That duty carries with it two presently relevant responsibilities. The first is to the obligation to avoid any conflict between his duty to his client and his own interests. He must not make a profit or secure a benefit at his client's expense. The second arises when he endeavours to serve two masters and requires full disclosure to both. The same ideas are reflected in the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, June 2011, Rule 12. 12.1 states, A solicitor must not act for a client where there is a conflict between the duty to serve the best interests of a client and the interests of the solicitor, or an associate of the solicitor, except as permitted by this rule. Before we proceed on to the other main categories of conflict of interest, we need to spend some time considering financial conflicts in a little bit more detail. There are five main categories. Firstly, no undue influence should be exerted on a client to derive a benefit. And that's covered by Solicitor's Rule 12.2. Don't borrow money from clients or former clients unless you fall within an exception found in Rule 12.3. Beware of obtaining a benefit under a will 
Rule 12.4. Receiving a financial benefit from a, from a third party, such as a referral fee, also gives rise to problems under Rule 12.4.3 and also Bar Rule 45. And conducting another business may see you fall foul of Rule 39 and Bar Rule 15. So let's look at each of these in turn. <clears throat> the first one is no undue influence should be exerted on a client to receive a benefit, Rule 12.2. So the actual rule states that a solicitor must not exercise any undue influence intended to dispose the client to a benefit, the solicitor, to dispose the client to benefit the solicitor in excess of the solicitor's fair remuneration for legal services provided to the client. Don't borrow money from clients or former clients unless you fall within the exceptions to Rule 12.3. So let's have a look at Rule 12.3. It says that a solicitor must not borrow any money nor assist an associate to borrow money from a client of the solicitor or of the solicitor's law practice or a former client of the solicitor or the solicitor's law practice who has indicated a continuing reliance upon the advice of the solicitor or of the solicitor's law practice in relation to the investment of money. Unless, and here are the exceptions, there are, that the client is an authorised deposit-taking institution like a bank, that the client's a trustee company, that the client is the sole responsible entity of a managed investment scheme, under Chapter 5C of the Corporations Act or a custodian for such a scheme, unless the client is an associate of the solicitor and the solicitor is able to discharge the onus of proving that a full written disclosure was made to the client and that the client's interests were protected in the circumstances, whether by legal representation or otherwise. There the reference is to separate independent legal representation, really. And finally, unless the client is the employer of the solicitor. So they are the only exceptions. You should also be aware of obtaining a benefit under a will, and in this regard, Solicitor's Rule 12.4 becomes relevant. And it says, a solicitor will not have breached this rule merely by then doing any of the following. So if you do these things, then you should be fine. 12.4.1 says, drawing a will appointing the solicitor or an associate of the solicitor as an executor, provided the solicitor informs the client in writing before the client signs the will of any entitlement of the solicitor or the solicitor's law practice or associate to claim an executor's commission, and um, inclusion in the will of any provision entitling the solicitor or the solicitor's law practice or associate to charge legal costs in relation to the administration of the estate, and if the solicitor or the solicitor's law practice or associate has an entitlement to claim commission that the client should appoint as executor a person who might make no claim for executor's commission. The provision continues in 12.4.2 by saying drawing a will or other instrument under which the solicitor or their practice or associate will or may receive a substantial benefit other than proper entitlement to executor's commission and proper fees provided the person instructing the solicitor is either a member of the solicitor's immediate family or a solicitor or a member of the immediate family of a solicitor who is a partner, employer or employee of the solicitor. So there are all of the allowable situations. Items that fall outside of that with respect to wills are not permitted. The next category is receiving a financial benefit from a third party or a referral fee. This is covered by Rule 12.4.3 and also by Bar Rule 45. So Solicitor's Rule 12.4.3 says that receiving a financial benefit from a third party in relation to any dealing where the solicitor represents a client or from another service provider to whom the client has been referred by the solicitor provided that the solicitor advises the client that a commission or benefit is or may be payable to the solicitor 
in respect of the dealing or referral and the nature of that commission or benefit, and the client may refuse any referral, and that the client has given informed consent to the commission or benefit received or which may be received. So it's only in those circumstances that you're entitled to these referral fees. Bar Rule 45 simply says that a barrister may not give a commission or gift to any person by reason of or in connection with the introduction of professional work by that person to the barrister. So it's quite clear. Another area that gives rise to problems is conducting another business. Um, so this is covered by Rule 39 and also Bar Rule 16. Bar Rule 16 is probably clearest and it just says that a barrister must be a sole practitioner and must not practice in partnership with anybody, must not practice as the employer of any legal practitioner who acts as a legal practitioner in the course of that employment, must not practice as an employee of any person, must be a legal practitioner director of, or must not rather, be a legal practitioner director of an incorporated legal practice or be a member of a multidisciplinary partnership. So there are quite um, stringent conditions on conducting other businesses. One of the areas that gives rise to um, a lot of problems, particularly in country areas where there might be a lack of solicitors, is a situation um, that may involve acting for both parties. The old adage is that no man can serve two masters, and that really lies at the heart of the ethical issues surrounding acting for more than one party. Legal practitioners have a fiduciary duty to give their undivided loyalty to their clients. The prescription against acting for multiple clients with conflicting interests applies to the firm and not just to a single lawyer within that firm. You can see this in Solicitor's Rule 11.1. So we'll now have a look at uh, Solicitor's Rule 11, which is headed Conflict of Duties Concerning Current Clients. We won't go through all the provisions of Rule 11. That's something that you do need to do. They're quite um, lengthy, but you do need to understand all of them. But just looking at some of them, in Rule 11.1, it says that a solicitor and a law practice must avoid conflicts between duties owed to two or more concurrent clients two or more current clients, except where permitted by this rule. So there's a general um, forbidding of this type of practice unless it's covered by the rule. It then continues, if a solicitor or law practice seeks to act for two or more clients in the same or related matters, where the client's interests are adverse, and there is a conflict or potential conflict of the duties to act in the best interests of each client, the solicitor or law practice must not act except as permitted by Rule 11.3. So here's where the exceptions come in. 11.3. Where a solicitor or law practice seeks to act in circumstances specified in 11.2, the solicitor may subject always to each solicitor discharging their duty to act in the best interests of their client, only act if each client is aware that the solicitor or law practice is so acting for another client, and has informed consent, or has given informed consent to the solicitor or law practice for so acting. And in addition to those requirements, where a solicitor or law practice is in possession of confidential information of a client, that is the first client, which might reasonably be concluded to be material to another client's current matter and detrimental to the interests of the first client if disclosed, there is a conflict of duties, and the solicitor and the solicitor's law practice must not act for the other client except when the following conditions are satisfied. The solicitor may act where there is a conflict of duties arising from the possession of confidential information, where each client has been given or has given informed consent to the solicitor acting for the other client, and a law practice and the solicitor's concerned may act where there is a conflict of duties arising from the possession of confidential information, where an effective information barrier has been established. This is in effect known as a Chinese wall. Now you should read the remainder of Rule 11, which deal with confidentiality and conflicts. The case of Blackwell against De Baroil, Proprietary Limited, 1994-123-ALR-81, provides a reasonable example of these principles at play. I've included an extract of this case in your notes. Please take the time to have a look at those. 
Lawyer witnesses. A lawyer who is likely to be a witness will have a conflict of interest with his or her role as a legal advisor. The conflict is the subject of Australian Solicitors Conduct Rules 2011 Rule 27. This provides that in the case in which it is known or becomes apparent that a solicitor will be required to give evidence material to the determination of contested issues before the court, the solicitor may not appear as an advocate for the client in the hearing. In a case in which it is known or becomes apparent that the solicitor will be required to give evidence material to the determination of a contested issue before the court, the solicitor or an associate of the solicitor or law practice of which the solicitor is a member may act or continue to act for the client unless doing so would prejudice the administration of justice. So being a potential witness also creates a mandatory exception to the Cabrank principle or Cabrank rule. And this is found in Bar Rule 95. The case of Chapman and Rogers, 1984, 1 Queensland reports, 582 has been included in your notes as an illustration of the principles. So you can have a quick look at that particular judgment and the um, conclusion of the judge concerned. Opposing a former client. Opposing a former client is the most frequent ethical dilemma that solicitors face with respect to conflicts of interest, particularly in regional areas and with the aggregation of legal firms. There are two distinct approaches to dealing with this issue. There's the approach of Rackerson and Ellis, Monday and Clark, 1912, 1 Chancery, 831. The test there was whether there, there is a reasonable probability of mischief. The second approach is Prince Geoffrey Volkjar against uh, KPMG, 1999, two we, um, weekly law reports, 227. The test there was whether there is a real or sensible possible whether there is a real or sensible possibility of misuse of confidential information. Now the Rackerson test is generally regarded as being too narrow, with the second broader attempt being much more acceptable. There is a specific um, rule in the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, namely Rule 10, which states conflicts concerning former clients. A solicitor and law practice must avoid conflicts between the duties owed to current and former clients except as permitted by Rule 10.2. 10.2 says that a solicitor or law practice who or which is in possession of confidential information of a former client where that information right might reasonably be concluded to be material to the matter of another client and detrimental to the interests of the former client if disclosed, must not act for the current client in the matter unless the former client has been given has given informed written consent to the solicitor or law practice for so acting, or an efficient uh, or an effective information barrier, or Chinese, in other words, Chinese wall, has been established. So what's a Chinese wall? This was described in Carindale Country Club Estate Proprietary Limited against Astle, 1993-42 Federal Court Reports at 307, as involving a firm taking steps to ensure that different solicitors within the firm act for each client and that the legal staff acting for the respective clients do not come into contact with confidential information given to the firm by that client or who their section of the firm is not acting and that the integrity of the client's information in terms of their right to confidentiality is not compromised. Now, in your notes, I've included extracts from various Chinese wall cases. Make sure you read them and see the slightly different approaches taken by the courts to these issues. But setting up a Chinese wall is one possible solution to opposing a former client, particularly for large firms. Sexual relations with clients. There is no specific rule prohibiting sexual relations between lawyers and clients in Australia. So says your text. I have included in your notes a radio transcript from the Law Report of August 2005 entitled Lawyers Who Sleep With Their Clients. 
It's an interesting topic, and um, as you'll see from listening to the law report or reading the transcript, um, there are many different views as to how this should be dealt with. At best, the issue would give rise to a conflict potentially with other rules that we've been considering in this course. It may raise issues as to competence, or maybe the lawyer preferring their interests over their clients. There is also the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rule, Rule 42, which deals with anti-discrimination and harassment. It says that a solicitor must not, in the course of practice, engage in conduct which constitutes discrimination, sexual harassment, or workplace bullying. bullying. The term sexual harassment is defined in the glossary of terms, if you'd like to have a look. The last area I'd like to mention is gifts from clients. There is a genuine need in this sort of situation for independent legal advice for the client. Consider the um, case of Wright against Carter, 1903, 1 Chancery, 27, at page 57, where Justice Sterling made this statement. Transactions between a solicitor and client are watched and scrutinised by the court with utmost jealousy. The court starts with the presumption that undue influence exists on the part of the donee and throws upon him the burden of satisfying the court that the gift was uninfluenced by the position of the solicitor. Secondly, this presumption is not a presumption which is entirely irrebuttable, though it is one which is extremely difficult to be rebutted. In order to uphold a gift, the donor must have competent, independent legal advice in conferring the gift. The court has still to be established that the influence arising from the relationship can no longer be supposed to exist. The independent um, solicitor does not discharge this duty by satisfying himself simply that the gift is one that is right and proper for the donor to make under all the circumstances. And if he is not so satisfied, his duty is to advise his client not to go on with the transaction and to refuse to act further for him if he persists in um, seeking to make this gift. So be very wary of gifts. And I think the general proposition to protect yourself would be not to accept gifts from clients. This concludes Topic 10, Conflicts of Interest. Next week we will be looking at Topic 11, The Adversarial System.